when it comes to the Western media, we have to understand that they have a serious dog in this fight. Were there not an Israel, the United States of America would have to invent an Israel to protect her interest in the region. The United States would have to go out and invent an Israel. Are you prepared to condemn yes, it? Yes. You, uh, you know, this game and this narrative... It's not a game. It's a game, it's a game, it's a game. Why? I'll tell you why. Why should you demand allow condemnation me, allow me, allow me, allow of, of people you. dying I'll, but not me, be prepared okay, to condemn allow it yourself? me to explain it to you and to your viewers okay. why it is a game. Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wa salatu wa ala rasulillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome all viewers. Today we have with us Abdul Rahman of Knowledge North and he's here today to talk about the situation in Palestine. And we want to get right to it and begin discussing basically what we've been seeing happening online with the media um, and their tactics in terms of questioning Muslims and how Muslims have responded to such questions. Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wa salatu wa ala rasulillah wa ba'd. Assalamu alaikum all viewers. Well, of course, the media, when we're talking specifically about Western media, the West itself is complicit in the problem, the root cause of the problem of Palestine, in the sense that the modern state of Israel, as it's known, was a creation of the West, specifically the Brits during the First World War. The British under General Allenby captured the land of Palestine from the Ottoman Empire, and they had control over it all the way till World War II. So in this interwar period towards the tail end of World War I and uh, the end and a bit after World War II, the British had, if you like, a, a stewardship of the land of Palestine, what was called by the League of Nations the British Mandate of Palestine. So in other words, they were babysitting Palestine until they could determine what to do with it conclusively. And what they did determine to do with it conclusively after the end of uh, World War II and off the back of the atrocities of Nazi Germany against various people, including the Jews during the Holocaust, they decided to follow through with a promise that was made in the famous Balfour Declaration, which is to give the Jews a homeland on the land of Palestine, which was not an empty space. There is this um, phrase, a land for people, for a people without a land. Basically, there was the indigenous inhabitants of Palestine, the Palestinians, were there originally. Uh, there was also a minority of Jews who we now refer to as pre-48 Jews, the pre-1948 Jews, meaning before the creation of Israel, there were Jews who were living side by side peacefully with the Arabs, the Arabs being both Muslim, the majority, and a minority of Christians. I traveled to Palestine extensively back in the day, and I saw some of these, and they do get on, the Jews, Christians, and Muslims, pre-48, I hasten to add. See, when the Christians ruled Palestine during the Crusades, then the Jews and the Muslims suffered. And under the British mandate, the Muslims suffered. And now that the Jews occupy Palestine, the Christians and the Muslims suffer. It's only under the Muslims that all three claimants to Abraham, and the Muslims being the true claimants, that all three religions, Judaism, Christianity and Islam, peacefully coexisted and prospered as good neighbors. In fact, the keys of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is believed by Christians to be where Jesus was crucified, the keys to that church are in the possession of a Muslim family and have been for a long time. The reason being is because the Christians, if you go inside that church, you'll see it's divided amongst the different Christian denominations. So the Catholics manage a portion of the church, as do the Armenians, the Syriacs, the Franciscans, the Copts, the Ethiopians, the Greek Orthodox, of course. Which is anyway, the various different churches, they have a section. And there has been bickering, actual fisticuffs sometimes between uh, these different um, denominations in terms of who's going to you know, manage what part of the church and prayer services and everything. And so in order to have a neutral peacekeeper, the keys to the maintenance and the opening and shutting of the church was handed over to a Muslim. That's just one anecdotal fact, if you like, which suggests that, the, or which speaks to the fact that Christians, Jews and Muslims do not need to be at loggerheads in the land of Palestine, and indeed weren't when the land was uh, conquered by Muslims 
under the reign of Umar ibn al-Khattab, that Allah be pleased with him, he allowed the Jews uh, to come back because the Romans, the Byzantines, the Romans had expelled the Jews from Palestine, the indigenous Jews at that time. So it was the Muslims who allowed them to come back and they had lived peacefully with Muslims, flourishing in fact, in the land of Palestine, along with the Christians maintaining their holy sites, all the way up until this period we spoke of, First World War, when the British took it over. And then when the British took it over, Zionism really started to have a big impact, which was this political ideology of uh, the Jews claiming this land as their own, having an, a national state based on their ethnos, their ethnic groups. It was not just institutionally racist, it was a constitutionally racist state. It's an ethnocracy, so it's racist from its foundation. And even then, that would have been one thing if they'd occupied some land that no one claimed, but there was people living in the land. So they took over that land, or they started emigrating to that land, and the British tried to maintain the peace as they started encroaching upon territory, which otherwise the Muslims and the Christian Arabs were welcoming them. Of course, Muslims are very gracious, and Arabs generally are very generous, have, have a history of hospitality or a culture of hospitality, as many Muslim ethnic uh, groups do, or ethnic groups which are predominantly Muslim. But then, of course, you know, there's only so much uh, people can take when when squatters essentially start taking their their farms, farmsteads, their water resources. And even then, that's one thing. But then when they start using violence to to terrorize the original inhabitants, which is what happened with some of these Zionist gangs. And from those Zionist gangs, where they killed indiscriminately, um, not just Muslims, not just Christian Palestinians, but also the British famous bombing of King David Hotel, for example. The Jewish terrorist organization, Irgun Zwei Leomi, openly admitted responsibility for the bombing. From those terrorist groups emerged Israel's first leaders, first presidents, prime ministers, etc. So anyway, the World War II concluded, the British decided we'll just hand over the land. They quit their mandate, their stewardship. The United Nations recognized Israel as a state, as if they had a right to vote on someone else's a third nation's lives and lands. And then the Jews implemented that resolution, that recognition of that state. They did what from the Palestinian side is known as the Nakba, which means a catastrophe, whereby the armed Jews by terrorizing the local population, forced them out of their homes in Palestine into neighboring countries, Jordan, Egypt, to Lebanon and other places, and of course within uh, other parts of Palestine, either way internally displaced refugees within what is now, like for example, Gaza and the West Bank and other places like that. From the Jewish side, Israeli side, they were called the War of Independence, their War of Independence. That was in 1948. So since that time, the Palestinians have been suffering under this apartheid settler colonial state of terrorist occupation. So in that sense, we see the West is complicit. And of course, Western media, particularly English language legacy media, have been taking a lot of the bandwidth in framing the pro-Israeli narrative. So it is very much an Anglo-American project. In fact, I'm reminded how it's been said that the Brits are the Greeks to America's Romans, in that the British birthed the intellectual foundation for American brutishness and hegemony, much like the Greeks laid the philosophical foundations and were the precursors of the might of Rome. <clears throat> so the Americans picked up, essentially, where the British left off, particularly after the 67 war between Israel and the Arab states. And they heavily invested in Israel, heavily supported it, helped it to militarize the state and boost its defense or, in many cases, offensive capacities. If we look at the Middle East, I think it's about time we stop those of us who support, as most of us do, Israel in this body, for apologizing for our support for Israel. There's no apology to be made. None. It is the best three billion dollar investment we make. Were there not an Israel, the United States of America would have to invent an Israel to protect her interest in the region. The United States would have to go out and invent an Israel. So when it comes to the Western media, we have to understand that they have a serious dog in this fight. They have a, uh, an aggressive 
rabid uh, dog in this fight because together the Anglo-Americans between them created the state and, and have helped to maintain it and the Western allies in general. Jazakallah khair akhi for that history and helping us understand uh, why there is this strong bias regarding Western media. Um, but if you could also share with us now, like how have we seen that bias play out? What are some of the tactics that we've seen? So if we take the example of Piers Morgan's live streams, his um, uncensored broadcast, he tries, so he claims to give a balanced perspective. So he's had at least four Muslims on so far who've been defending the Palestinian cause and speaking out against the awful savagery that's been unleashed upon Palestinians in Gaza particularly. And you find that he and others who represent this apologism for apartheid always seem to put the burden upon the defenders of the Palestinians, the pro-Palestinians, be they Muslim or non-Muslim, by having them start by condemning, insisting that the pro-Palestinian camp, and we include ourselves amongst them, uh, not because Palestinians as an ethnic group are worthier than any other ethnic group, but in this particular situation, they are the oppressed and they are not the oppressor. And as Muslims, we always go with, with justice. So the pro-Palestinian camp, who are the camp standing for truth and justice, are always cornered, are always challenged to condemn what happened a few days ago on October the 7th, when a party of militants, largely led by Hamas, but not exclusively by them, made an incursion into what is considered Dakhil Israel or Israel proper. So from Gaza, they went into southern Israel. It's been described as a terrorist attack, wherein at least 1,400 Israelis or innocent parties, at the very least, were slaughtered. And these are all words that you'll find that the media has been using Western media. Given that you want others to condemn acts that kill people, even if they're not responsible, given that Hamas have brazenly admitted responsibility for what they did, yeah, are you prepared to condemn yes, it? Yes, you, uh, you know, this game and this narrative... It's not a game. It's a game, it's a game, it's a game. Why? I'll tell you. Why should you demand allow condemation me, allow me, allow me, allow of, of people dying I'll, but not me, be prepared okay, to condemn allow it yourself? allow me to explain it to you and to your viewers okay. why it is a game and a very vicious, mm. unfair, asymmetric game that has contributed to the oppression of my people for 100 years. Mm -hmm. And so that itself is an unfair framing. And of course, from the perspective of the person who receives this question, it's a huge guilt trip, right? Because you're being made to say, look, apparently, although a lot of this has been discredited, babies were beheaded, as many as 40 at least, women were raped, children were shot in their beds and so on and so forth so as muslims we of course we as people of justice we acknowledge and we have to stand by the uh, guidance of allah and his messenger as pertains to war so we have a just war code the code of jihad which precludes the murder and the execution of non-combatants certainly children are considered not are responsible for their actions and women are also are exempt ordinarily as are all people as are worshippers as are laborers from the normal rules that would apply in a state of war so for that reason perhaps the muslim automatically is expected or the pro palestinian is expected to, to condemn what happened on october 7 but you'll find muslims aside even non-muslims who are astute to the game that's being played, have refused to condemn this act or described as terrorism. Those who try very hard to extract from people like me, from DiEM25, a condemnation of the attack by the Hamas guerrillas uh, will never get it. And they will never get it for a very simple reason. Those who care about humans without any discrimination, those who care equally about a Jew and an Arab, must ask themselves a very simple question. 
What exactly is their idea of the cessation of hostilities? That Palestinians are going to lay down their arms and go back to, into the largest open-air prison in the world, where they are constantly suffocated by the apartheid state. And I likewise would encourage all Muslims and all those on the pro-Palestinian side not to take the bait, not to accept this framing that there was a terrorist atrocity on October the 7th, which we have to condemn. Why not? Or what is the danger of conceding to this point that it was a terrorist atrocity? Is because what they hope to get from you, what they want from the pro-Palestinian camp is to acknowledge that a crime was committed against the state of Israel. And then off the basis of that crime, the state of Israel is allowed to respond accordingly as it sees fit. And therefore they justify what we see happening in Gaza. In other words, if you deny them the, the whole premise of the question, you deny them any justification to go and declare war upon the Palestinians and to hunt out and seek and destroy those so-called terrorists, which we know, of course, and we're seeing daily, unfortunately, is indiscriminate whether they even pretend they are targeting militants or not. In some cases, they will go straight for hospitals, schools, refugee camps, convoys of civilians, border crossings. So it's absolutely indiscriminate. The whole campaign is waged on the basis of a punitive measure against those who perpetrated an act of terrorism on October the 7th, and we reject this. Does this mean that the warmongering media really care for our condemnation either way? Or that the anti-Palestinian militaries need us to greenlight their genocidal wars? Obviously not. But by refusing to play their condemnation game, by refusing to accept the fake news of the Fusaq, we deny them the moral high ground. That we must never cede. And we must be seen and heard to deny them that moral ground. Now, does this mean that we're saying that an act of terrorism, just because it might be done by a Muslim or someone who's oppressed, is allowed in Islam? Absolutely not. Islam is unequivocal in acting according to righteous guidance in all scenarios, even those scenarios where your life is in danger, you still can't oppress others because that which is built upon falsehood is itself falsehood. The ends in Islam never justify the means. The means have to be righteous in order to attain a righteous end. Therefore, even in acts of self-defense, even in war fighting, you cannot murder those who have no truck in your persecution. This is very clear from Islam's rules of war. But the only documentary evidence we have, or rather the bulk of the documentary evidence we have, actual video recording and interviews from those who escaped and survived, all speaks to the country. באנגלית, אל תדאגי, אני מוסלמי, אנחנו לא נפגע בכם. זה תפס אותי ב... מצד אחד בהפתעה, מצד שני זה הוריד לי הרבה לחץ. וישבתי עם הילדים שלי, והמחבלים אה, הביאו כיסא מהפינת אוכל. היה אה, מחבל חמוש כל הזמן איתנו בממ"ד. והשאר מסתובבים בבית. אחד מהם רואה על השיש בננות, אומר לי, אפשר לאכול אחת? אמרתי לו, כן, אתה יכול לאכול אחת. מה הילדים אומרים? הגדול קצת יותר נלחץ. הקטנה לא ממש הזיז לה, הייתה עסוקה בטאבלט שלה. הם היו אצלי בערך שעתיים. בסוף השעתיים האלה, אחד מהם סוגר לי את דלת הממ"ד, והם יוצאים. זהו. וזהו. الإنسانية عنا مش عنده ما حدا حيصيبها عشان تعرف إنه الإنسانية عنا أيوة استروها استروها وخلوها لما تأخذوها حية اعرفوا خليها تعرف مع أطفال نعم لا بنتكلم بانو إن متناقمين لأنه بصورة مأود إنوشيت لو مر شيء شمريم على كم هذا ما هو إنوشيت شمريم على إنه هم نصيبهم لشتات طوبي شام شمريم شاخو بلاخات شمريم وتانو 
הייתה תחושה מאוד מאוד מפחידה, אבל אף אחד לא, לא, לא התנהג אלינו באלימות. And again, these groups who did this act, the Palestinian groups, we generally, as Muslims, of people of Quran and Sunnah, we have issues with some of their politics and their allegiances, as well as some of their religious understanding. However, in this particular case, as we would do with anyone, we have to judge a people according to the evidence before us. And it just so happens, the incursion of the Palestinians into their ancestral lands, the lands from which their grandparents were ethnically cleansed, all of the video evidence shows that they were trying not to harm women and children. They were trying to put them at ease. This is according to their own propaganda, their own videos, and according to the testimony of the Israelis who survived, whose homes they had temporarily seized, or who had managed to escape in firefights. And then they even admitted, some of the Israelis admitted that there were many deaths of their fellow Israelis, and they blamed the death not on the quote-unquote the Muslim militants, but on the Israelis. They said they were shooting indiscriminately, and they killed many of our own people. <laughs> Which of course, the media knows about all of these statements and all of these claims because they are aired on Israeli television itself. But of course, in order to justify a particular narrative here in the West, these uh, statements and these, this documentary evidence is suppressed. And again, if there was any uh, harming of innocence of children, anything that would contravene the Sharia, we would, would be the first to condemn it. But what seems to be clear from their own statements and from their witness testimonies is that if that happened, it happened in spite of their actions and not because of it, given the circumstances being as they are. The military focuses on the forces of the military, on the genocide. لكن في كل الحروب يسقط بعض الضحايا من المدنيين لسنا مسؤولين عنهم That's not to say that people weren't killed in crossfires or even some people might have went off script and committed something which could be understood to be a callous murder but the evidence suggests that this was not the goal nor the experience of all of the people who interacted with the Palestinians Jazakallah khair, I think you, you made some very important points, and I think this is sort of like the crux of the issue, because like you said, this is the tactic that's being used to really push a specific agenda, and it's it's very, very effective. So really focusing on that. I mean, firstly, you mentioning the history. This has also been something very interesting, is because, you know, without even getting into the specifics of what occurred on that day, um, many people are just you know, they're, they're kind of realizing, well, what's going on over there in the first place? And what kind of atrocities have, has happened to the Palestinian people? Focusing on, well, what's going on with the Palestinians? How many Palestinians uh, have been killed, civilians, children? Um, what sort of injustices have, have they faced? And I feel like online, uh, with just the freedom of the internet, we've seen a lot of people um, waking up to what's happening um, to our brothers and sisters in Palestine. And they really uh, have a lot of empathy and they're, they're very upset about how they've been treated and, and they're focusing heavily on that. Meanwhile, it still seems like the mainstream media is trying their best to push that, that narrative because, like you said, they have a serious dog in the fight. They have a serious agenda themselves. Um, but, you know, with the, the Internet, this is sort of um, what I've noticed. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? The thing is, if one understands the context... And this, this kind of parable or this scenario has been painted by many people. And it was said actually by uh, the regular guest on Peace Morgan herself, a non-Muslim, bear in mind, said, imagine if someone was to come into your home. This is the, given the scenario of the, of the Palestinian experience now and why Gaza, the Gazans reacted the way they did. Imagine if someone was to come into your home, force you into the cellar, massacre your family, and they were enjoying the spoils of their conquest, the squatting in your, your home, eating away while you're starving and suffering in the darkness. One day, the sole survivor of the family breaks out of the cellar and then he is blamed for getting into a bit of wax on, wax off with those who illegally occupied his home after murdering and butchering his family and forcing him into the cellar. That is the experience of the people of, of Gaza or Gaza or the Palestinians in general, in that, as we mentioned at the beginning, 
the Palestinians were driven out of their homes, their towns, villages were raised to the ground. Hundreds of villages were raised to the ground. And then in the case of Gaza, they were forced into what has been described as an open-air prison. It's a concentration camp, which as we witness now, is routinely turned into an extermination camp. Eventually, there's only so much the people can take, and they break out. And when they break out, of course, it's going to be an act of violence. It's a jailbreak. It's an extinction rebellion, a slave revolt. So violence breeds violence. We would not want any violence, of course, but... This is the natural result of brutalizing a people. Actions and reactions are equal and opposite. Yes, yeah, subhanAllah. I mean, that's a very, very deep point. And um, I, at the very least, if anybody made it this far in the video and they're really following along and paying attention, I, I think it's really crucial that people at least understand what's going on in the media and how different narratives, um, you know, regardless of actually even what's true or what's not, um, you see people sometimes they're speaking past each other and they don't really understand the other person's perspective based on what they're being fed and what they're believing. Um, because, you know, subhanAllah, some people, if you check their social media profiles, there's certain, you know, non-Muslims that I know uh, having a non-Muslim background. And it's like everything that they're fed regarding this situation, it is a very extremely biased and dishonest um, skew toward um, Israel being the um, the, the ones who are basically, they're, they're completely innocent. They're completely being attacked and terrorized and they're just spreading it all over social media. And they're, they're believing all the propaganda, some, which has already been proven to be false and debunked, but they're still, they're still reiterating it. So, um, you know, when you're dealing with people like that, if they don't even understand what we're speaking about, if they don't even understand your perspective, our perspective of what actually happened, what do we really believe? Uh, happen? What do we really believe in as Muslims, as human beings? Then it's like um, you can really see how crazy things can get in terms of just being misrepresented, in terms of misunderstanding each other. And, and that's why also having the freedom to have long form conversations like this is very important. And it's been a, a game changer, I think, majorly having social media, because when it comes to these Western media outlets, they I mean, everything is sort of framed to, to be, if you can come on for a certain amount of time, they're trying to frame in a certain way and they're trying to push their agenda, you know? So I just wanted to highlight that. As Muslims, as people wanting truth and justice for all people, looking from the outside in, all we can do is comment on the superficialities of what we see. And that is that this entire situation, this entire fitna, this evil that we see is born of a racist in position of a settler colonialist experiment upon the people of Palestine who are innocents and they are oppressed. Uh, they broke out October the 7th, they fought back and now there's a massive retaliation where we see the true, the true intent of the state of Israel and its Western backers, which is to indiscriminately slaughter and commit acts of genocide against the people of Palestine. I know the word Genocide is a very law determined, has serious legal international law ramifications. But this is something as recently as uh, today, an Israeli Holocaust scholar, Raz Sigal, has uh, decried as a uh, textbook case of genocide. It's an Israeli Holocaust scholar saying this about what the Israelis are doing. I think that indeed what we're seeing now in Gaza is a case of genocide. Uh, we have to understand that the UN Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide from 1948 requires that we see special intent for genocide to happen. And to quote the convention, intent to destroy a group as defined as racial, ethnic, religious, or national, as such, that is collectively, not uh, just in uh, individuals. And this intent, as we just heard, is on full display by Israeli politicians. And going back to the point we began with why we need to be careful of not conceding this point of saying that what happened the Hamas led action was an act of terrorism again we find Jewish pro-Palestinian advocates refusing to condemn it does it really surprise you is it really a shock that a couple of days ago the people of Gaza most of whom, let's bear it in mind, most of whom were born 
in that concentration camp. Mm -hmm. They were born into it. Does it really shock you that they would do something desperate to break free of that concentration camp? Mm. And who dare criticize whatever tactics <clears throat> they employed? I am not approving it, but I am not disapproving it. Mm. Because I don't know what I would do if I had been born into a concentration camp and spent 20 years of my life there. Not that there might not be, as we've already stated, according to the Sharia, some condemnable actions, but these questions are politically motivated. I'm reminded of when an earlier pope was asked about an earlier incident where there was some killing between some Palestinians and Israelis and he was asked to the Pope was asked to condemn the Palestinians and he refused and the questioner the interviewer said how can you as the head of the Catholic Church condone violence he said I'm not condoning any violence but your question is politically motivated had it not been I could easily tell you what we as Christians believe but your question has a political agenda behind it you want me to underwrite the response of violence against the persecuted Palestinians, and I will not give you that. So that was very decent of the Pope back then, the most eloquent, in fact, and the most credible advocates of the Palestinian cause are all themselves Jews, including children of Holocaust survivors. And we can read off a long list from Norman Finkenstein to Max Blumenthal to Ilian Pape to Dan Cohen, uh, Miko Pellet, Amy Goodman, and for those feeling particularly feisty, Gilad Atzmon. And the list goes on and on. Jazakallah khair, Rahman. This was very um, enlightening and beneficial. We make dua for all of our brothers and sisters in Palestine. Uh, may Allah grant them success in this life and the hereafter. May Allah ease their pain and suffering. And may Allah guide us to do that which we need to do um, to become, you know, the the capable ummah that, uh, inshallah, we uh, we will someday uh, become. So may Allah keep us firm. And thank you so much, Akhi. Everyone, please check the links in the description. Make sure you go and you um, subscribe to Knowledge North's YouTube channel. He has some very uh, beneficial playlists. And uh, hopefully we'll have him back soon to uh, further discuss uh, some of these issues. Subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdika shayru wa la ilaha ila anta staghfirka wa tubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.